excerpts from Timothy Leary's The Politics of Ecstasy. The Molecular Revolution. Politically oriented activists have throughout history left the psychedelic minority pretty much alone. The power holders have been too busy fighting each other to worry about those who prefer to live in quiet harmony and creative quietude. It is harder work to contact and control your nervous system than the external symbol structure. Yogis, bhikkhus, meditators, Sufis, monks, shaman, hashish mystics, and all these have been too busy decoding and appreciating their afferent, sensory, and cellular communication systems to busy themselves with political struggles. But now comes the molecular revolution. Two Commandments of the Molecular Age Two new ethical commandments are necessary as man moves into the molecular age. These are ethical commandments. Compared to these imperatives, the codes of earlier prophets seem like game rules, codes for social harmony. The new commandments are neurological and biochemical in essence, and therefore, I suspect, in closer harmony with the laws of cellular wisdom, the law of the DNA code. If the moral center of gravity is maintained, the endless chain of political and administrative decisions can be dealt with confidently and serenely, but there must, that stone must be placed first. The moral and ethical stone must be placed before these political and administrative decisions can be made. I did not invent these two commandments. They are the result of several hundred psychedelic sessions. They are revealed to me by my nervous system, by ancient cellular counsel. I give them to you as revelation. I ask you not to take them on faith, but to check them out with your own nervous system. I urge you to memorize these two commandments. Meditate on them. I urge you to take 300 gamma of LSD and present these commandments to your symbol-free nervous system. The future of our species depends upon your understanding of and obedience to these two natural laws. Ask your nervous system. Ask your DNA code. The Two Commandments for the Molecular Age 1. Thou shalt not alter the consciousness of thy fellow man. 2. Thou shalt not prevent thy fellow man from altering his own consciousness. Thou shalt not alter the consciousness of thy fellow man. And thou shalt not prevent thy fellow man from altering his own consciousness. The scientist must take the drug himself. The mind-altering chemicals, lysergic acid and amino acids, etc., have to be studied from within. The scientist has to take the love pill and the smart pill. You can't use these internal microscopes by clapping them over the eyes of unsuspecting mental patients and army privates. The scientist has to look through them. Oh yes, you can observe their effects from outside, but this tells you very little. You can sacrifice the animals and discover brain changes. You can drug mental defectives and psychotics and seniles and terminal patients and observe gross behavior changes. But these gross behavior changes are the irrelevant husks. Consciousness must be studied from within. Each psychedelic chemical opens a complex energy language which must be deciphered with exacting discipline and code-breaking ingenuity. The molecular psychologist must decipher these languages. Eventually, everyone will learn them. This is not a new idea. This is the core idea of all Eastern psychology. Buddhism, for example, is not a religion. It is a complex system of psychology, a series of languages and methods for decoding levels of consciousness. The Courage to Know Frightening? Yes, it is frightening. And this defines the first criterion of the scientist of consciousness. He must have courage. He must embark on a course of planfully and deliberately going out of his mind. This is no field for the faint of heart. You are adventuring out, like the Portuguese sailors, like the astronauts, on uncharted margins. But be reassured, it's an old human custom. It's an old living organism custom. We're here today because certain adventurous proteins, certain far-out experimenting cells, certain hippie amphibia, certain brave men pushed out and exposed themselves to new forms of energy. Where do you get this courage? It isn't taught in graduate school or medical school or law school. It doesn't come by arming government agents. It comes from faith. Faith in your nervous system. 
faith in your body, faith in your cells, faith in the life process, faith in the molecular energies released by psychedelic molecules, not blind faith, not faith in human social forms, but conscious faith in the harmony and wisdom of nature, faith easily checked out empirically. Take LSD and see. Listen to what your nervous system and your cells tell you. Take marijuana and learn what your sense organs can tell you. Take RNA and learn how the molecular learning process works. Trust your body and its reaction to the complex messages of the psychedelic drugs. Precellular consciousness and its implications. The precellular level of consciousness is experienced only under a heavy dosage of LSD. Your nerve cells are aware, as Professor Einstein was aware, that all matter, all structure, is pulsating energy. Well, there is a shattering moment in the deep psychedelic session when your body and the world around you dissolves into shimmering latticeworks of pulsating white waves, into silent, subcellular worlds of shuttling energy. But this phenomenon is nothing new. It's been reported by mystics and visionaries over the last 4,000 years of recorded history as the white light, or the dance of energy. Suddenly you realize that everything you thought of as reality, or even as life itself, including your body, is just a dance of particles. You find yourself horribly alone in a dead, impersonal world of raw energy feeding on your sense organs. This, of course, is one of the oldest oriental philosophic notions, that nothing exists except in the chemistry of your own consciousness. But when it first really happens to you through the experience of LSD, it can come as a terrorizing, isolating discovery. At this point, the unprepared LSD subject often screams out, I'm dead! And he sits there transfigured with fear, afraid to move. For the experienced voyager, however, this revelation can be exalting. You've climbed inside Einstein's formula, penetrated to the ultimate nature of matter, and you're pulsing in harmony with its primal cosmic beat. Has this happened to you, Mr. Leary, after, uh, often during a session? It's happened to me about half of the 311 times I've taken LSD. And every time it begins to happen, no matter how much experience you've had, there is that moment of terror because nobody likes to see the comfortable world of objects and symbols and even cells disintegrate into the ultimate physical design. Do you think there may be a deeper level of consciousness beyond the precellular, Mr. Leary? Well, I hope so. We know that there are many other levels of energy within and around us, and I hope that within our lifetimes we will have these opened up to us, because the fact is, is that there is no form of energy on this planet that isn't recorded somewhere in your body. Built within every cell are molecular strands of memory and awareness called the DNA code, the genetic blueprint that is designed and executed the construction of your body. This is an ancient strand of molecules that possesses memories of every previous organism that has contributed to your present existence. In your DNA code, you have the genetic history of your father and mother. It goes back, back, back through the generations, through the eons. Your body carries a protein record of everything that's happened to you since the moment you were conceived as a one-cell organism. It's a living history of every form of energy transformation on this planet back to that thunderbolt in the Precambrian mud that spawned the life process over two billion years ago. When LSD subjects report retrogression and reincarnation visions, this is not mysterious or supernatural. It's simply modern biogenetics. Internal Political Revolution versus External Political Revolution Mr. Leary, in this connection, according to a spokesman for the student left, many former campus activists who have gone the LSD route are more concerned with what's happening in their heads than what's happening in the world. Any comment? Well, there's certain truth in that. The insight of LSD leads you to concern yourself more with internal or spiritual values, you realize that it doesn't make any difference what you do on the outside unless you change the inside. If all the Negroes and left-wing college students in the world had Cadillacs and full control of society, like the people who run the show now do, they would still be involved in an anthill social system unless they opened up themselves first. 
Mr. Leary, aren't these young ex-activists among an increasing number of students, writers, artists, and musicians whom one critic has called the psychedelic dropouts? LSD users who find themselves divested of motivation, unable to readjust to reality or resume their roles in society? There is an LSD dropout problem, but it's nothing to worry about. It's something to cheer. The lesson I have learned from over 300 LSD sessions, and which I have been passing on to others, can be stated in six syllables. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Turn on means to contact the ancient energies and wisdoms that are built into your nervous system. They provide unspeakable pleasure and revelation. Tune in means to harness and communicate these new perspectives in a harmonious dance with the external world. Drop out means to detach yourself from the tribal game. Current models of social adjustment, mechanized, computerized, socialized, intellectualized, televised, Sanfordized, make no sense to the new LSD generation who clearly see that American society is becoming an air-conditioned anthill. In every generation of human history, thoughtful men have turned on and dropped out of the tribal game and thus stimulated the larger society to lurch ahead. Every historical advance has resulted from the stern pressure of visionary men who have declared their independence from the game. Sorry, George III, we don't buy your model. We're going to try something new. Sorry, Louis XVI, we've got a new idea. Deal us out. Sorry, Obama, it's time to mosey on beyond this so-called great society. The reflex reaction of society to the creative dropout is panic and irritation. If anyone questions the social order, he threatens the whole shaky edifice. The automatic, angry, knee-jerk accusation against the creative dropout is that he will become a parasite on the hard-working, conforming citizen. This is not true. The LSD experience does not lead to passivity and withdrawal. It spurs a driving hunger to communicate in new forms, in better ways, to express a more harmonious message, to live a better life. The LSD cult has already wrought revolutionary changes in American culture. If you were to conduct a poll of the creative young musicians in this country, you'd find that at least 80% are using psychedelic drugs in a systematic way. And this new psychedelic style has produced not only a new rhythm in modern music, but a new decor for our discotheques, a new form of filmmaking, a new kinetic visual art, a new literature, and has begun to revise our philosophic and psychological thinking. Remember, it's the college kids who are turning on, the smartest and the most promising of the youngsters. What an exciting prospect, a generation of creative youngsters refusing to march in step, refusing to go to offices, refusing to sign up on the installment plan, refusing to climb aboard the treadmill. What will they do, Mr. Leary? Don't worry. Each one will work out his individual solution. Some will return to the establishment and inject their new ideas. Some will live underground as self-employed artists, artisans, and writers. Some are already forming small communities out of the country. Many are starting schools for children and adults who wish to learn the use of their sense organs. Psychedelic businesses are springing up, bookstars, art galleries. In our technological society of the future, the problem will not be to get people to work, but to develop graceful, fulfilling ways of living a more serene, beautiful, and creative life. Psychedelics will help to point the way. It's unfortunate that most of the scientific studies on creativity have been done by psychologists who don't have one creative bone in their body. I must admit that LSD and marijuana do not allow you to walk to the piano and ripple off great fugues. Psychedelic drugs, particularly marijuana, merely enhance the senses. They allow you to see and hear new patterns of energy that suggest new patterns for composition. In this way, they enhance the creative perspective, but the ability to convert your new perspective, however glorious it may be, into a communication form still requires the technical skill of a musician, or a painter, or a composer. Mr. Leary, do you dread the prospect of imprisonment? Well, I belong to one of the oldest trade unions in the human civilization, the alchemists of the mind, the scholars of consciousness. The threat of imprisonment is the number one occupational hazard of my profession. Of the great men of the past to whom I hold up as models, almost every one of them has been either imprisoned or threatened with imprisonment for their spiritual beliefs. 
Gandhi, Jesus, Socrates, Lao Tzu, the classical outlaw. I have absolutely no fear of imprisonment. I consider myself the freest man in America today. If you're free in mind and heart, you're not in trouble. I think that the people who are trying to put other people in jail and to control basic evolutionary energies like sex and psychedelic chemicals are the ones that are in trouble because they're swimming upstream against the two billion year tide of cellular evolution. Mr. Leary, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned from the personal use of LSD? First and last, the understanding that basic to the life impulse is the question, should we go on with life? This is the only real issue when you come down to it in the evolutionary cosmic sense, whether to make it with a member of the opposite sex and keep it going, or not to. At the deepest level of consciousness, this question comes up over and over again. I've struggled with it in scores of LSD sessions. How do we get here and into this mess? How do we get out? There are two ways out of the basic philosophic isolation of man. You can ball your way out by having children, which is an, an immortality of a sort. Or you can step off the wheel. Buddhism, the most powerful psychology that man has ever developed, says essentially that. My choice, however, is to keep the life game going. I'm Hindu, not Buddhist. Who wrote the cosmic script? What does the DNA code expect of me? Is the big genetic code show live or on tape? Who is the sponsor? Are we completely trapped inside our nervous systems or can we make real contact with anyone else out there? Mr. Leary, what role do you think psychedelics will play in the everyday life of the future? A starring role. These chemicals will inevitably revolutionize our procedures of education, child rearing, and social behavior. Within one generation, these chemical keys to the nervous system will be used as regular tools of learning. You will not be asking your children when they come home from school, not what books are you reading, but which molecules are you using to open up new libraries of Congress inside your nervous system. There's no doubt that chemicals will be the central method of education in the future. The reason for this, of course, is that the nervous system and learning and memory itself is a chemical process. A society in which a large percentage of the population changes consciousness regularly and harmoniously with psychedelic drugs will bring about a very different way of life. Mr. Leary, will the psychedelic experience become universal? Will everyone be turned on? Well, not all the time. There will always be some functions that require a narrow form of consciousness. You don't want your airplane pilot flying higher than the plane and having Buddhist revelations in the cockpit. Just as you don't play golf on Times Square, you don't want to take LSD where narrow, symbol-manipulating attention is required. In a sophisticated way, you'll attune the desired level of consciousness to the particular surrounding that will feed and nourish you. No one will commit his life to any single level of consciousness. Sensible use of the nervous system would suggest that a quarter of our time will be spent in symbolic activities, producing and communicating in conventional tribal ways but the fully conscious life schedule will allow considerable time, perhaps an hour or two a day, devoted to the yoga of the senses, to the enhancement of sensual ecstasies through marijuana and hashish, and one day a week to completely moving outside the sensory and symbolic dimensions into the transcendental realms that are open to you through LSD. This is not science fiction fantasy. I have lived most of the last six years, until the recent unpleasantness, doing exactly that, taking LSD once a week and smoking marijuana once a day. Mr. Leary, how will this psychedelic regimen enrich human life? It will enable each person to realize that he is not a game-playing robot put on this planet to be given a social security number and to be spun on the assembly line of school, college, career, insurance, funeral, goodbye. Through LSD, each human being will be taught to understand that the entire history of evolution is recorded inside his body. The challenge of the complete human life will be for each person to recapitulate and experientially explore every aspect and vicissitude of this ancient and majestic wilderness. Each person will become his own Buddha, his own Einstein, his own Galileo. Instead of relying on canned, static, dead knowledge passed on from other symbol producers, he will be using his span of 80 or so years on this planet 
to live out every possibility of the human, pre-human, and even subhuman adventure. As more respect and time are diverted to these explorations, he will be less hung up on trivial, external pastimes. And this may be the natural solution to the problem of leisure. When all of the heavy work and mental drudgery is taken over by machines, what are we going to do with ourselves? Build even bigger machines? The obvious and only answer to this peculiar dilemma is that man is going to have to explore the infinity of inner space to discover the terror and adventure and ecstasy that lie within us all. Drop out or cop out. It's always been that way. It will always be that way. There are two societies, two symbiotic cultures uneasily sharing this planet, two intertwined human structures, mere image like root and branch. The overground and the underground, the dropouts and the copouts. There's the visual establishment, officious, federal, rational, organized, uniformed, at times grim, at times smug in its apparent control of external power, metal, machines, weapons, the copouts, the cops. And there's the dropout underground, loose, sloppy, foolish, tenacious, private, at times joyous, at times paranoid protected by its camouflage, conspiratorial laughter, the knowing glance, the facade of poverty, long hair, out-of-fashion dress, the covert, subtle gesture, the double meaning sustained by its access to inner power, touch, taste, sensual connections, laughter, smell, moist contact, ecstasy. The external power structure is forever rent by struggles for material control, national rivalries, economic competition, political conflicts, ideologies of might. The boring battles of generals and politicians, the CIA versus the FBI, etc. The underground society is also divided on the basis of somatic, domestic, sensory, erotic, ritual, and chemical preferences. The battles of clans and cults, of magicians and saints. This ancient duality has reached an evolutionary crisis point today. To see what's happening, and it's never reported in the papers, you have to be aware of this overground underground ballet. But to see it, you have to be underground. The overground establishment today just can't see what's happening, just can't accept the dedicated, enduring, inevitable existence of the underground. LBJ has no logical, rational categories to deal with the apolitical smile, that soft chuckle which comes from neither the left nor the right, but from some center within. In earlier, wiser times, this struggle was clearly recognized as the essential battle between God and the devil, in which the devil, who is always he who controls the external power, systematically switches the labels for obvious tactical reasons, and calls the static, regulated, dry, grim, humorless, destructive anti-life good, and calls the free, ecstatic, sensual, moist, funny, joyous, bad. This doesn't fool the turned-on undergrounders, who are hip to the fact that God is a singing, swinging energy process who likes to laugh and make love, and burrow, murmuring deep underground. The underground is always aware of the existence and reflex responses of the overground. Survival in the underground depends on your ability to anticipate the movements of external power. It's always been a capital crime to laugh, to make love, and turn on barefoot in front of Whitey's house. And these are the endemic, chronic crimes of the giggling young, the colored, the artists, and the visionaries. The structure of the overground is always obsessively and specifically organized. Read the rule books and directories. Today the whole freaky social structure is listed alphabetically in the yellow pages of the phone book. Conversely, the structure of the underground is equally explicit and obvious to those in the know, but this knowledge is experiential, whispered, word of mouth, friend to friend, and rarely written down. Can you write down a good joke? The telephone directory has no listing for the soft essences, the chemical secretions of life, love goddesses, alchemists, ecstasy drugs, astrologers, religious experiences, prophetic visions, fun, laughter, wry humor, the warm hand that slips under your pretenses and touches you in exactly the right place. Where are these classified? The underground is always composed of the outs, those who are alienated from the establishment power centers, and voluntarily by deprivation, or voluntarily by aesthetic religious choice. 
The young, the poor, the racially rejected, the articulately sensitive, the spiritually turned on, are curious, sensual, ecstatic, erotic, shameless, free, mischievous, rebellious, intuitive, humorous, playful, and spiritual. Adults, the middle class, the cops, the government men, the educators, those people listed in the yellow pages are not. No funny business here, this is serious. In the past, the polar tension between the two societies was balanced by the slow ebb and flow tide of history. Underground pressure builds up gradually over decades, and eventually an ecstatic upheaval occurs from below. Christ, Buddha, Muhammad, then slowly a new hierarchy emerges. Now, you see, don't you, that you learn nothing about the psychedelic underground and the electronic generation from the establishment press? Hippie is an establishment label for a profound, invisible, underground, evolutionary process. For every visible hippie, barefoot, beef-flowered, beaded, there is a thousand invisible members of the turned-on underground, persons whose lives are tuned into their inner vision, who are dropping out of the TV comedy of American life. Parents, if you want to understand what these new kids are doing, you have to tune in to the communication channels that carry the underground message. Read their newspapers. Every city in the country has its underground paper serving its young readers with the news they want and advertising the commodities they want and the language they understand. The East Village Other, the Oracle of San Francisco, or the Oracle of Los Angeles, for example. Read any college newspaper that is relatively free of faculty control. Also, listen to their music. The rock and roll bands are the philosopher poets of the new religion. Their beat is the pulse of the future. The message from Liverpool is the newest testament, chanted by the four evangelists, St. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Pure Vedanta, divine revelation, gentle, tender irony at the insanities of war and politics, sorrowful lament for the bourgeois loneliness, delicate hymns of glory to God. To learn the lesson from your kids, you've got to groove with their electronic, fluid, timeless point of view, which is both the newest and the oldest human philosophy, and accept their up-revision of Shakespeare in which Juliet's sleeping potion becomes a turn-on sacramental love elixir, and Romeo took it with her in the tomb and they laughed in ecstatic revelation and pity at that old posturing Montague Capulet hang-up and they split together from Verona and opened up a little loot shop in Rome and stayed high forever after. And then Lady Bird Macbeth built a fire and lit a candle and some incense and put a tender chant on the stereo, rolled a joint of scotch broom, and she and Macbeth sat looking into the dancing flame and got soft and high and saw how foolish it was to struggle for the throne and dissolved into love for each other and for their rivals and prayed for them. Tune in. Get very comfortable and close your eyes and listen to the sermon from Liverpool. Could just as well be Donovan or Dylan or the Jefferson Airplane. And learn that it's the oldest message of love and peace and laughter. And trust in God and don't worry. Trust in the future and don't fight. Trust in the kids and don't worry because it's all beautiful and it's all right.